And the topic about automation is probably no better segue into the uh, final talk for the evening where we're going to see really some magic. I keep talking you up. I hope you don't feel like <laughs> I'm putting too much pressure on you. Uh, but really, it's going to be an impressive talk about what is possible with connecting systems across multiple platforms and uh, what you can actually accomplish. So are we connected here? Yeah, give me a minute or two. I'll give you a minute. It's a, it's a brand new MacBook, so plenty of problems. Uh, Ye old new MacBook. Yes. <laughs> see, I'll give it a okay. three to one countdown. It looks good. There, uh, it looks good. Yeah, is that coming through? Let me see if I need to mirror. Where's, where's that, that guy that has the magic hands? There he is. <laughs> <laughs> give it applause for magic hands. He's been doing a great job all evening. <laughs> It gives a good chance for the remaining mm -hmm. people out there that uh, realize that we're missing one speaker to sprint across the auditorium and make their way in. Hey, look at that. Magic Perfect. Hands. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So, you all set? Yeah, it looks good. All right. Big hand of applause for Sean. Well, thank you for having me. Um, like Jesse said, I'm going to talk about uh, GraphQL tooling, um, what's possible today. Uh, a little bit about what's possible in the near future and then some long-term ideas. Uh, but primarily, I want to focus on like the reason that you actually care about all of this is that you want to accelerate adoption of your APIs. Right? You build these APIs, you put your blood, your sweat, and your tears into them, and it's heartbreaking if people don't end up using them. And I think a good way to get people to use them is to make sure that every step along the way of using your API uh, is a joyous one. Uh, so a quick background about me, I'm Sean, coming out of San Francisco. I work at a company called OneGraph. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but in a previous life, I ran engineering for a payments company. Um, and my personal background is I worked a lot in Clojure and ClojureScript, worked a lot on the uh, compiler for that. These days, I tend to live in a Reason and Rust world. Um, but for the past decade or so, I've worked uh, pretty focused on dev tooling, uh, so much so that it's very near and dear to my heart, and bad dev tooling makes me very sad. So today, I want to talk about, uh, first of all, why should we care at all uh, about the GraphQL tooling and possibilities and whatnot uh, in order to set up context? Because the meat of this is going to be a lot of rapid fire demos and ideas across the whole spectrum of GraphQL. And I realize it's the last talk of the day, so it's going to be a little bit hard to keep up, potentially. So I want to set that frame. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, the future, um, about what's possible. So let's start with why we would actually care. Um, I think there, there are two things to keep in mind about your API, uh, in particular around uh, adoption. And that is that content is king and competition is fierce. Uh, for any given API, the two things I actually care about are what data does it have that I care about, and what can it do on my behalf? What effects can it achieve um, that is going to actually help me achieve my business goal? And this is important because we've actually talked to a lot of API companies. And it turns out that for any, like on average, for any of these API companies that we talk to, about 20% of their business deals are actually blocked on an integration phase. Because what happens is they have good content or they provide good effects for a business and someone in the business side decides to spend money on it, um, expecting that the integration phase is going to go relatively smoothly. But what happens is upon proving the value of the API, the integration phase actually ends up taking so many engineering or so much in terms of engineering resources that the business person actually has to get a schedule on the engineering resource roadmap. Right? And th these are engineers who are trying to actually ship product, not integrate your API. So <clears throat> whenever we look at API integrations, there are two factors that I, I tend to think about. One is, what is the absolute amount of energy required to successfully integrate your API from understanding what it has to offer, to reading through the documentation, to successfully integrating it, running monitoring, all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of the, the cost of integration. The other side of that is the intrinsic motivation. So how happy is it going to make me as a developer to actually spend time on this? I think all of us have spent time dealing with APIs that made us deeply sad as human beings, and that those kind of integrations take a lot longer to finish. 
And so if your company is offering an API that makes people sad, it is going to take them longer to finish. It is going to be more difficult to actually push those deals through. And the sad thing is that APIs are rarely known for sparking joy, right? We can actually name the, the companies that do APIs very well off the top of our heads because there are so few examples of people who uh, have trailblazed in this, this area. And I think that's for a couple of different reasons. Um, some of it is maybe ivory tower design, uh, where you have people who design the API are very far removed from the people who actually end up using it. Uh, and there's a lack of empathy there. there. It's hard to understand what people are looking for in an API. But I think far more common is just simply a lack of resources. Whenever you're building out an API, you typically want to spend time in your domain model. Right? You've thought about, you have a business, you have a product, and you're modeling out an API that matches that. But in addition to that, to actually deliver a good developer experience, you need to build out a bunch of documentation and design tools and monitoring and so on and so forth. And it's very difficult to actually amortize this, right? The companies that do this very, very well have actually invested a lot in here, but that's not a, a, a luxury that all of us get to enjoy. And I think it's good to bring up maybe a, a typical story because the people who implement APIs and the people who adopt APIs typically see things very differently. Uh, as an API provider, this is oftentimes how I view my API. I kind of figure that a user's success just increases linearly with the more time they, they spend, right? That's for X, min uh, X minutes spent reading my documentation and hitting my endpoints, the user is going to be Y successful. But in reality, we've actually seen something much more like a sawtooth bridge, where you know, maybe step one is I have to find your, I Google for your, your API docs and I find them, and then I have to kind of parse them because you've invented your own uh, documentation system, which is beautiful and, and lovely, but it's different from everyone else's. I have to figure out where in the, impi or where in the API actually has the data that I care about. I have to kind of maybe visually guess what is the data gonna look like when it comes back. I'll finally maybe test this out, maybe with curl or something on those lines. Having gotten some data back, I'll have to figure out why it wasn't, didn't look like it did in the docs. Having actually got some data back, now what I want to do is move that into a useful context, like building my app or something like that. Now I have to like, try to remember back in like, what were the fields that were coming in there. And ultimately, the only reason I'm hitting your API is to pull down data to integrate with my, my local data. Right, so I actually have to bridge that and figure out how to get your data to work with mine. And then I'm good to go, right? So I've worked my way all the way through here, just in time for you to release version two, and I'll start over. And this is actually a kind of generous view because not all of these steps are equal. Some of these steps will cause a much bigger drain on a developer's resource or energy level than others, in particular auth. We see that whenever a developer has to implement a, a custom OAuth flow or whatnot to hit your API in a production way, they'll typically lose up to like half an hour or an hour easily. And the reason for all these kind of drop off in productivity or, or dropping out of flow, there are a couple of different ones, but you know, some of it is because of the ad hoc learning that I have to kind of figure out how you uh, do your own special Snowflake documentation. Some of it is I'm shifting between documentation and my code and kind of a testing environment. Some of it is I have to recall um, what your documentation said versus what I'm actually seeing in my code. And it's kind of crazy because as developers, right, as API providers, uh, we're aware of the misconceptions that other people have about our productivity. Very often, a non-developer will approach us and think, well, I'll just grab five minutes of their time and uh, we'll chat about this thing, and then they'll be, the developer will be productive uh, right away. And we know that it's actually, it takes time to recover. Once you've been knocked out of flow, it takes time to recover and get back into that state of flow every time you're interrupted. And as an API provider, you should be very concerned about this because every time I get knocked out of my flow, I don't feel happy, and I'm going to actually start thinking about uh, other things. So these are actually tab competition points. That's where your tab is in my browser, but it's sitting next to literally the best sites on the internet that are engineered to grab my attention anytime I'm feeling bad. So for every API, you wanna kind of, there are three criteria that you want to look for. So in particular, it's the time to initial success. So from me learning of your API to actually feeling like I have some success with your API, 
that needs to be as short as possible. The second is the intensity of the success. How much of a superhero did you make me feel like? How, how amazed do I feel about what I was able to achieve with your API in such a short amount of time? And then finally, having made me successful, uh, what is the next time I'm going to feel successful? So for example, if I'm in your documentation and I'm able to run some uh, example endpoints and I see data coming back, that's great, that's a huge success. But if it then takes me an hour to properly implement all of the auth and get that into my code, then that's a long time without any sort of success. So you can just translate these criteria into maxims for any API design. Uh, one, the first of which is deliver the quickest initial success possible, maximize the wow factor, and make sure that every step along the way, the user is in a constant state of success, that they feel successful and not disappointed with your API. And I think GraphQL helps hugely here. It is, first and foremost, inherently machine-readable. By virtue of construction, every GraphQL server is introspectable by another computer. Right? We can ask the GraphQL server and say, hey, what types do you have available? What objects do you have? What fields do you have? What is the description of them? Uh, what are the types? Is it nullable? And that in and of itself is OK, but what it enables in terms of shared tooling for the ecosystem is huge. We can actually build tools that will introspect any GraphQL server and will generate some pretty amazing experiences. And based off of that tooling, that enables us to build better and better um, GraphQL servers, which in turn enable us to build better tooling. So that's kind of the preface. That's setting up the why we care and why GraphQL might be able to help us out here. And so what I'm going to do now is dive into just a bunch of demos and kind of show you uh, from the maybe mundane for some of you who are experienced with it to some of the esoteric um, demos. So first of all, I want to start with an oldie but a goodie, Graphical. So this is Graphical. This is one of the original killer apps of GraphQL. So you can point this at any API, any GraphQL server, and you can get kind of autocomplete, right? So we can just kind of autocomplete our way through an API. If I'm not sure of any of the fields, I can just kind of click my way through here, and I kind of almost accidentally end up building a query. So this is pretty nice. Uh, that was certainly a demo that won me over, I think back in 2015 when I first saw this, because that is such an incredibly different experience than what was out there before. Uh, you can do some of that with REST, some of that with you know, Swagger and whatnot, uh, but this, this looked like a pretty interesting tool at the time. The thing is, this is actually, I think, almost bad for the GraphQL ecosystem. Because one of the things that happens, once you figure out GraphQL and you fall in love with it, you are almost, by definition, unable to explain why it is good, and you are unable to empathize with people who haven't learned it yet. So I work at OneGraph, like I said. OneGraph, the idea is very simple. It's a single API endpoint through which you get access to Salesforce and Stripe and QuickBooks and NPM and whatnot. And we started when GraphQL was fairly young. I mean, GraphQL is still fairly young, but it, when it was even younger. And so we had people uh, who did not know GraphQL. They signed up for OneGraph to get access to their data. And what happened was... Hmm? Oh, loose. All right. So we had people who signed up because they heard, you know, OneGraph can get access to whatever very easily. And they actually thought that GraphQL was our own proprietary language. And they're like, yeah, this is cool, but do you really expect people to be able to learn your own language? Just to give you a sense of how much customer education is required if you are building a GraphQL API. And the thing with the graphical was we thought we just put it in there and people would figure out the magical keystroke of control space and they'd be able to autocomplete their way through our API, right? It's a self-documenting API, it's beautifully designed, they're going to have no problem. Uh, but what we found is that graphical is a blank canvas. And if you look at the syntax, it's actually, I mean, for us, it looks all right. But for someone who doesn't know GraphQL, it's incredibly intimidating. Uh, so that, a blank canvas combined with needing to know how the syntax works was a big deal. So we built the GraphQL Explorer. 
or the Graphical Explorer. And the idea here was to help on onboard new users to GraphQL. And so this is a plugin that works with any graphical instance, and it just kind of visualizes your schema, almost like a file explorer. So I can come in here and say, maybe I want to explore Spotify, and I see a search. And notice how it, it automatically focuses the query because it says it knows that that's a required uh, argument. So I'm going to search for a query, and any tracks that match that, I'm going to get their ID and their name, and I'll go ahead and run that. Let me log into Spotify real quick. And there we go. So I'm able to kind of visually go through and let's call this one search. So I'm able to go through visually and explore an API. And as I express, I can express the data that I want over here, and I can see the syntax build up on the right-hand side. So this gives me a way of building up almost like a muscle memory of saying, all right, if I want this, this is what it looks like over here. And it gives a way, it kind of smooths the transition. Right, where a lot of the investment in the GraphQL ecosystem was focused on people who were already experts in GraphQL, a lot of people were getting stuck at the blank canvas stage. And so we really wanted to help smooth this out. So this is a tool that can be plugged in and will work with any GraphQL server. Uh, and actually, as a quick s side note, I originally, or we originally built that for newcomers, uh, but I have found that it uh, is by far my favorite way of building things. And we don't mention it anywhere, but if you have used this, uh, here is a secret. If you hold on Option, it will actually select all of the fields available at any given level. So that's, uh, we don't do that because you shouldn't be doing that, uh, and everyone asks for it. Um, but if you're a power user and you know what you're doing, then you can go ahead and do that. All right. <clears throat> so we helped users figure out uh, the data that they want. They can express their intent, they see a GraphQL query coming up, and then they go ahead and uh, get some results back. So I'm going to copy this over here. Now, the challenge is, uh, this is actually not a useful context. This is great for exploring an API and experimenting, seeing what's available, uh, getting some initial data back. But no one, or it's very rare, that this is actually the end goal. The only reason you come to Graphical is to figure out the query you need to put somewhere else, probably inside of some app of some sort. And so what we want to do is figure out how we can help you get it out of this context and into a more useful context as smoothly as possible. Just like the Graphical Explorer helped onboard you, we wanted to help or figure out how to get you between a result and to a working app as smoothly as possible. And so what we did is we built this tool that actually analyzes the AST of your GraphQL query, and it will generate a full application. And the first one that we built, so this was uh, a little pet project of mine, is it will actually analyze the AST and export it to a Bash program, because who doesn't want to use GraphQL in Bash? So over here, I have two operations. One is a query that's going to get some information. Given an NPM package name, it'll get the number of downloads last month. And the other one is going to pull um, an RSS feed by a GraphQL. And so I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to go ahead and just paste this in. We'll chmod that. And now whenever I run this, you can see it says, hey, here are the two operations available. So it analyzed those operations inside of the Graphical Explorer. And so I'll say, well, I want to run the NPM one. And I'll provide some uh, variables here. And so let's see how many times the GraphQL package was downloaded last month. And let's pass that into JQ. And there we go. So we can see that the, <laughs> thank you. So we can see that the GraphQL package was downloaded two or three times last month. Um, and then I really like this one, so I'm going to come in here and copy an RSS link. Same idea. So we'll do RSS, URL, we'll paste that in, and there we go. Now we have a JSON-based RSS reader inside of GraphQL, or inside of uh, Bash. Uh, that said, I assume that most of us are not uh, using Bash that often. So what I'm going to do is build up a different one real quick. 
So I'm going to go back and add a search. So same idea as before. So we'll do search, Spotify, uh, win, 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 and any tracks, ID, and their name. And now I'm going to add a mutation. And this one is going to be pause. And this is going to go into Spotify, and I see all the uh, options that are available. So I'm going to run the pause mutation, and this is going to reach out and modify the state of my uh, Spotify player. And having paused it is going to then return me the new state. So I want to know, uh, are you playing, and what's your progress? And we'll add two more, one of which is resume. So same idea, Spotify will resume, uh, is playing, and progress. And then the last one will be next. So Spotify, uh, skip next track, and is playing progress. OK, so now what we want to do is actually, instead of a bash, let's go ahead and look at JavaScript. And you can see here that we've analyzed uh, the operations, and we've done the same thing, where we're actually generating a React component for each of these operations. And like I said, we have a lot of users who have never used GraphQL before. So our view on this world is a little bit different. And we see a lot of bad practices. In particular, we see people who don't know that you can name operations or uh, use variables. So what they do is instead of using variables, they actually concatenate strings at runtime and then send those over as a way of kind of interpolating uh, the variables. And so what we try to do is we try to analyze the query and uh, provide best practices. So you can see here, I haven't named this operation. So in the code, it named it unnamed query. And it says, hey, maybe you should consider giving this a name. There are all sorts of benefits if you do. And if I come back in over here and I give it a name, that goes away. So the idea is we don't block you at any step along the way, but we gently guide you towards the best practices. And now what I'm going to do is this looks like it's working. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I could copy and paste this, but I'm just going to hit Create Sandbox. So this is going to create a new React application over here. And you'll notice that auth has been embedded in here. As a provider of this API, I know how you should be doing authentication inside of our API. So I've already generated that. So now I'm making live queries in a React application. And now I'm going to go ahead and uh, let me make this give this side by side with a Spotify player. And what I'm going to do is start playing. Whoops. And I'm going to hit pause. You notice it pauses. I'm going to resume. Next. And you'll notice that I built an entire Spotify controller, a whole React application, just by visually exploring the API, building up the operations I wanted, and then generating a React application with all of the best practices embedded. And the reason that that's so important is because when someone is trying to adopt your API, they are desperate for success. They're desperate to translate the API documentation to a working app. And what that means is that they are going to cobble together whatever they can to get a working thing. So they're going to get the minimum amount of code together so they can actually call your API. And it's unlikely to include all of the best practices that you would want as an API provider that's going to make both your life and their life better. So then what's going to happen is they might leave a comment saying, hey, come back later and fix this. But they probably won't. And the next time that someone wants to use your API, they're going to search for the easiest thing, which is to go find the example that already works. And they're going to copy and paste that. And any bad practices are now going to spread through their code. So what you want to do as an API provider is to make the right thing the easiest thing. And copying and pasting is by far the easiest thing. And so that's where you want to have something like the code exporter, where you can make it very, very easy to consume your API with best practices um, so you don't cause me to have to think about uh, how to use it. So uh, next level would be auto-parameterizing queries. So I mentioned that we see a lot of people who don't know about variables. Variables are actually kind of an esoteric uh, part of GraphQL. And so what we want to do is actually kind of auto-parameterize uh, the queries. And the way we're going to do this is inside of the Explorer, we're going to have a little icon 
that you, whenever you hover over a argument, and whenever you click on the icon to parameterize it, it's going to reflect on the field type and say, all right, password is a required string. It's a non-nullable string. Uh, and then it's going to replace the hard-coded value that you have in there, and it's going to insert it as a variable dependency. So we end up with something like this, where we've turned it into a variable, and then we've created the, uh, the default value here. Uh, and let me show you what that looks like in practice. So you can see here, I'm, about to, I'm building a sign-up form, and it's parameterized by a lot of different things. And so what I'm going to do is start coming in here and say, well, I want to make that a Boolean. And if I right-click on it, uh, in this case, I'm just right-clicking to parameterize it, uh, it will actually parameterize it, and it will go back and forth. So if I don't want that to be uh, a parameter, it won't be. And then down here, it's actually building up a form that my user would actually see. What is this actually going to look like for the end user who's trying to consume this? So you can see I have a full sign-up form down here that I can come in and start experimenting with and get real-time feedback on, is this form doing exactly what I expect it to be doing? And it's using all of these nice best practices where all of the variables are properly parameterized rather than concatenating crazy strings and sending that up to the server. So we're calling that smart forms. It's not open source yet, uh, but we will get there. And I want to compare this to existing experiences. So we played with the Spotify API, and Spotify actually has a great REST API. It is really, really well documented. But because the REST API is so difficult to introspect, that means that the tooling is really hard to share. That means that all of the tooling that they've built, they've basically built themselves or bought from some vendor. And that means that the depth that they're able to go to is relatively limited. Um, and on top of that, the documentation for that site is, is inert. I can't go from the documentation on their site to some working code very easily. There is a big context shift uh, when jumping between those two things. Uh, one other thing is uh, traversing graphs. So quick question, uh, who can uh, traverse graphs? I think humans and computers can both traverse graphs. And of those two, I would say that uh, computers are generally better. And so this is one thing I'm personally really excited about. This is an extension to the uh, GraphQL or Graphical Explorer. And the idea here is this doc panel over here is great. If I search for a pull request, I see, OK, somewhere in here, there is a GitHub pull request with all these fields. But the problem is, I actually don't know how to navigate to this node from the root. Right, from all those top-level fields, I don't know how to get to go. I know what I want, but I don't know how to get there. And so it would be nice if I could just kind of come in here and say, well, I know there's an email field somewhere. Go figure out where that is. And have a computer walk through the entire graph for me, figuring out where that is. And then I say, oh, yeah, somewhere inside of uh, Dropbox. I wanted that. So if I click on that, then it's going to go ahead and build up the entire graph, or the entire structure, all the ancestors, to get there. And if you think about what a difference that is in experiencing APIs, where I come to your API looking for either some effect or some data, and I just say, I don't know where it is, but this is what I want. And then it's able to actually generate an entire query or mutation that will get me exactly what I want. That is night and day difference in terms of onboarding. Another one is multi-APIs. Uh, Integration is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I hate it. Integration sucks. Uh, it's generally never very fun. But I think that GraphQL actually has something huge to offer here. Um, it's actually why I originally got interested in GraphQL, because I, I had to integrate um, 20 or 30 different APIs. Uh, and the example I want to show here is Hasura. So show of hands, who has heard of Hasura? Uh, who has used it? And who has used it in production? OK, so a handful of people. Uh, the short pitch for Hasura is that it's like Firebase, except it's on Postgres, it's standard GraphQL, and it's entirely open source. I don't know exactly what their business model is. I think they're a bunch of chumps to give this all away, but it is amazing. I'm really, really enthusiastic about these folks. 
But basically what they give you is you can point Hasura at any Postgres database and it will give you a real-time GraphQL API that is absolutely superb. Postgres is great and GraphQL is great. Hasura makes them great together. But one thing we've been working with them together on is uh, joining multiple schemas together. And I want to show an example of that here where I have a uh, console here. So this is the uh, Hasura console. And I have a Postgres table called user. And so you can see here it's exposed a user node here. We're using the Explorer to build this out. And what I'm saying is, all right, well, on this user, I'm going to get their first name, their last name, and their Stripe customer ID. And Stripe customer ID is a foreign key. And foreign keys are terrible. The only reason you ever have a foreign key for a thing is to get to the thing. And you as a programmer in this scenario can query into uh, Postgres, you can get a Stripe customer ID, pluck it off, and then you manually, imperatively, make a call into Stripe's API and pull out the data that you need on a Stripe customer. So that's a lot of work to actually integrate these two different data sources. But what Hasura has been able to do is actually have these things called remote joins, where you can bring in any remote GraphQL schema, and it will introspect it, just like we saw beforehand, and it will merge those two schemas together. But more importantly, you can come in here and actually add a derived field. So you can see I've already pulled in one graph. And so now what I'm going to do is add a remote relationship. And I'm going to say, on the user table, I want to create a field called Stripe Customer. I don't want Stripe Customer ID. I want Stripe Customer. And this is actually going to come from one graph. And this is what the connection looks like. So it's just like the Explorer. I'm going to go in there and say, oh, well, it comes from Stripe. It's Customer. And the ID parameter is going to come from the Stripe customer ID row on the table. So I, that's done. I'm going to go back to graphical. I'm going to get rid of the Stripe customer ID. And now what I'm going to do is actually just join into Stripe and start pulling data out from there. So I'm hitting my data store, and it's reaching out and pulling in data about all those customers from Stripe transparently. That level of integration is hours or days of work. And we can do that in seconds with GraphQL and remote schema stitching like this. So I think multi-APIs is phenomenal. In particular, if I have a GraphQL API and you have a GraphQL API, and suddenly the integration looks like that, right? it's going to get done a lot faster, and I'm going to feel a lot happier as a developer. And I would actually say, you know, Stripe has an amazing API. They have great documentation. They have great client libraries. But if you were to compare the experience that we just saw with Hasura to even their great Node uh, JavaScript APIs, it's not even a comparison. It's so much more work to pull in data from Stripe as a library than it is from Stripe as an introspectable graph. So one other one that I really like is that, again, we're talking about useful context. And I think the autocomplete inside of uh, VS Code goes a long way there. Right? So just like before, this is effectively graphical inside of uh, VS Code. So if I'm looking through the Salesforce API, I can come here and each step along the way, I can actually just kind of autocomplete my way through here and get uh, all the fields I need. And yes, it's a bit like graphical. You know, the, the, we haven't put the Explorer in here yet. Um, but this idea is, like, by the time you're here, you're probably familiar with it. Um, but this is a pretty radical idea, I think. Being able to auto-complete your way through remote schemas is crazy. Well, at least for me. And then one other thing I want to show is that GraphQL goes everywhere. Part of the reason that I built that Bash exporter it wasn't just for the lulls. It wasn't just a joke. But we wanted to show people and to encourage people to think that GraphQL doesn't just exist on the front end. We wanted them, it's, it's right now so tightly associated with the front end that people kind of limit it there. But actually, GraphQL can go to lots and lots of different places. And importantly, developers are not the only people who can consume GraphQL and build things. In fact, the largest platforming program in the world is Excel something like 650 million users. And so what we did is we built a version 
of the graphical explorer. So you can see over here, uh, it's rendering slightly different. It's not the actual field names. It's uh, showing something like a bit more human readable. But you can point this at any GraphQL server, and it will introspect it. And now as an Excel user, I can start pulling in data. So I'm going to pull in data from uh, Salesforce here. And what I want to do is actually generate a, uh, f a revenue forecast. And the revenue forecast is going to come from data from Salesforce. I'm going to pull down a list of my opportunities. I'm going to get their size. I'm going to get their uh, probability. And I'm also going to traverse over to the owner of it. And I don't care that I'm traversing over the API. I'm just expressing the data I want. And now that I have the data inside of Excel, I can make magic happen. Right? Excel is like this magical escape hatch where you know, managers and non-technical people can actually be incredibly independent. The challenge is getting the data in there. So I just kind of going through here, and once I have this built up, like Excel gives me this crazy UI. So I can say, well, maybe I want to see how Daniel's doing on the expected revenue forecast, or I only want to see the uh, closed opportunities. Like Excel actually generates a really good UI. This is a really nice experience, as long as you can get the data inside of Excel. And think of how many times you know, you've had a manager say something like, hey, I need a list of all the users who signed up for the past two months so I can do a whatever analysis. And then you go and you generate a CSV, and you send it over to them, and they say, well, actually, I also need their email and their first name, and by the way, can you sort it by you know, a number of stars or something like that? And the thing is, developers in that case are actually being, like, they're a poor interpreter for the Excel user's desires. But if we can just make it so Excel users are independent, where if you have that Hasura endpoint with all of your APIs behind it, suddenly give them a read-only access to it, and they can pull in all the data they need, and they'll be fine. Uh, one other area where I think GraphQL excels that isn't uh, often looked at is server-to-server -server communication. So what I'm going to do here is uh, build a subscription, and it's going to go into uh, NPM. And what it's going to say is, any time a package is published on NPM, I want to pull out these fields. I want to pull out the name of the package. I want to know the downloads last month. And also, if this is associated with a GitHub repository, then I want to go over into GitHub, and I want to get a list of issues. And I'll pull out the first 10 of them, and I want to know uh, maybe just the open issues. And I'll get the total count. So now I have a subscription that any time NPM is going to publish anything, it's going to give me some information from NPM and some information from GitHub. And what I want to say is I want you to just deliver this. Rather than delivering it over uh, WebSockets, which is where subscriptions are traditionally used, I can say I want you to deliver this to my server. Um, so you know wherever it might be. And I'll show you uh, a list of what we have uh, as an example. So we'll come in here. And this is the query actually running live. And it's just been delivering every package that's been uh, published to NPM. And if I refresh, it should, uh, yeah, 27 seconds ago. So you can see it's just pulling out the exact data it needs. And so for asynchronous server-to-server -server communication, GraphQL actually really excels. Because you can say, here are the events that I can offer you. These are all roots into the graph somehow. And you can figure out the query that you want to make whenever something happens, and just tell me where to deliver it. So incredibly powerful. Auth. So we talked a lot about auth so far. Um, auth sucks. It's one of those things that I think should just go away. Uh, and I think the way you make it go away is by building it deeply into your, your API. And so I want to show a login example where, uh, so I'm going to come in here. And let me go ahead and clear this out. And I'm going to query into Stripe. And you'll notice that this button popped up right here. And the reason it did that is we normalize the auth missing error across all of the services. And so you can see here, in, under uh, errors and extensions, we have a type here of auth missing auth, and then the service. And so what that means is there is one single function that checks the results of every single result as it comes back from the server and says, were there any errors of type auth missing? 
If so, what was the service? And it pops up a, a button asking the user to sign in. So now as a developer, I don't have to think about that at all, right? I just have one bit of middleware that handles that for my entire application. And this actually extends to things like progressive authorization. So progressive authorization is what you should do as a developer who cares about your user's experience. Uh, what you should do is say, you know, whenever a user logs into your application, you should only ask for the bare minimum uh, permissions or bare minimum scopes that you need in order to satisfy them at that moment. And then progressively, as they do things through your app, you can actually ask for that specific permission. But this is such a pain as a developer because you have to remember, what permissions do I have right now? Uh, what does this require? Uh, and then contextually ask accordingly. So what you get is you sign into an app and it says, hey, I need these 20 permissions uh, and you know, either take it or leave it. And I think progressive auth is the right thing to do. It's just very difficult. But can we make it just go away? And I think the way we do that is by annotating our schema just with some directives. And we're saying some metadata here. We're saying, hey, this field requires these scopes. And now whenever a developer ask for a field that they don't have access to, we have a normalized error, which is just insufficient auth. And this is the scope that you actually needed for that field. And so now what happens is, as a developer, I program as though I have access to everything. Right? I just make API calls. And then there's just one bit of middleware that checks the results of that and says, hey, that thing I just tried to do, did I, was I missing any scopes? And if so, I'll go ahead and ask the user for that. And now the user is contextually prompted, user, that button you just clicked, turns out we need send uh, permissions on Gmail. Right? So now the user gets their best experience, and the developer gets their best experience. And it's this really nice way of making all these hard problems go away while still improving the experience for everyone. And then another question we get is, how do you implement auth? So implementing auth on the GraphQL side is still uh, up in the air. In particular, authentication is relatively easy, right? It's just, who are you? But authorization is a bit more difficult, right? Because authorization entails, what are you allowed to do? And what you're allowed to do oftentimes depends on facts about you, right? Are you part of my GitHub org? Uh, are you the owner of this playlist? Uh, have you ever committed to my repository? Whatever it might be, there are certain facts about you I need to know um, in order to generalize your authorization. But if we have a graph that knows where these facts are, then we can actually build a pretty cool um, way of encoding all of that. So this is AuthGuardian. Uh, this is not open source, but the idea would generalize to any other API. And what this does is actually just introspect on the GraphQL API and generates a UI like this. So what I'm going to do is whenever a user logs in to any service, so GitHub, Egghead, Spotify, whatever, I'm going to run all of these rules. And if any of the rules succeed, then I'm going to actually execute this predicate. So for example, on GitHub, if this user is a member of an organization called OneGraph, then what I'm going to do is on Hasura, I'm going to set a default role of admin. And this is going to generate a uh, JWT or a JWT for me. And I'm going to now go ahead and log into GitHub. And now, because I am a member of OneGraph, you can see this is a preview of what that job is going to look like. But what I also want to do is say, on GitHub, when a user is logged in, so login status is true, then I want to set a value of user.id to a built-in value. And there are a bunch of built-in values that we know about, like uh, GitHub user ID. And you can see here that that looks good. And I'm going to do one more. So I do user.login. And it's a built-in value of uh, the GitHub login. And we can do more. So we can say on Salesforce, whenever this person has an email with a domain that's uh, equal to onegraph.com, then on Netlify, add a role of uh, sales. So on Netlify, you can restrict access to different endpoints based off of a Netlify uh, jot. And so with this, I'm actually able to encode a ton of rules about my authorization in one central place. Right? I can actually look at these rules as a human being and say, this looks right for the permissions that should be available. And then based off of that, we're able to go into, uh, so let's do one graph auth or Apollo. So this is what it actually looks like 
whenever it comes time to embed this inside of your API. So this is using uh, Apollo Server. And we're simply saying that in order to access the account balance, you have to have a role of admin. So over here, I can also, as a human being, glance at this description of our API and make sure that all these rules actually seem consistent. So we're boiling down something that has traditionally been very, very imperative and scattered across a bunch of code into small siloed bits where we can analyze the rules for authorization and the requirements for accessing data separately. So, and then at the end, we end up with one single jot that will work with our Apollo server, it'll work with Hasura, and it will work with Netlify, et cetera. All right, so big jump here. I'm gonna now talk about docs. So, uh, documentation is another area that I think is very difficult. Rebecca talked about this in her talk that actually very many GraphQL developers think of GraphQL as being self-documenting. Right, because the tooling is so nice and it's introspectable and you have all these you know, visual explorers and whatnot, uh, users will just figure it out. But this is emphatically not the case. Um, a determined one may, but human-oriented documentation still has a very strong place, right? being able to understand the examples and the overall structure of your API. But docs have a number of problems, and the first of one First of them is that docs lie, right? There are lies, damn lies, and API documentation. And that's not because developers are bad people necessarily. There are lots of different reasons, right? Maybe you wrote the documentation and it, you never had time to actually test it out, or you wrote it and it worked, but the implementation actually drifted off and now the documentation is outdated. Um, there are a number of APIs that are like that that I've been dealing with. Um, it's very common. So while documentation has a really nice place, it is actually also a double-edged sword because it's easy for it to become a negative, where I go and I copy and paste your example, thinking it's going to work, and actually hit a, a, a wall. So in this case, we have a uh, GitHub repository example saying, hey, if you want to query your GitHub repositories, here's how you do it. But you'll notice that there is the missing T here. And so if someone were to paste this in, it wouldn't work. So here's a proposed solution. What you can do is connect to a little service to your uh, GitHub repository, scan all of the markdown files where your documentation exists, pull out any of the GraphQL code blocks, and then verify that the docs, that the query inside of there is actually valid for your current schema. And then you can do this on every build, right? You simply run this as a, here's my schema, here's my GitHub repository, are there any examples which are now invalid based off of the, the schema I'm about to push. And then you get something like this, where it says, hey, there is actually no argument called first. Maybe you meant first. And now you will never break an example without knowing it. But once you have those examples, you can actually take them to more interesting places. In particular, you can take them, for example, into graphical where if I'm looking at a type over on the right-hand side, it can say, hey, here are all of the examples that actually reference this type or this field. And I can start to explore that much better than trying to navigate to that like we saw earlier with the, um, the search. And this is even better than search because this is an example that's going to have some human documentation that says something like, hey, uh, if you're trying to list uh, your recently purchased domains, here's how you do it. And then you can make it really easy, in fact, for your users to submit examples. So this is a little graphical plugin where it'll take whatever you have working in there and you think, hey, other people might like this. I might wanna share it with them. And what it will do is submit it, and now that example will be tested on every uh, CI run to make sure that it isn't being broken without your knowledge. And now your users can contribute examples and actually grow your documentation for you. And then the last problem is that docs are dead things. They're kind of inert. You write them, and they stay that way until you go and you, you update them. And I actually think that you can combine these techniques um, with some analytics. And you can say, what I want to know is for all of the new users who signed up in the past two weeks, 
what are the most popular fields? Show me like, you know, 90% of them hit these three fields. And the computer can't tell you what those fields mean. It doesn't know the semantics of that, but you do. And it'll say, hey, I don't know. Here's the general shape. What is this? And you can say, oh, this is a, a user who's trying to get a list of their recently purchased domains. You say, okay, well, add a description. You say, well, you know, here's a description of this example. If you're trying to do this, then blah, 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 blah. And now that becomes an example that will go inside of your docs. And your docs will actually respond uh, to the behaviors that it sees. Right? So now whenever new users come and they start accessing different parts of your API that you haven't documented quite as well, or there aren't examples, you can be notified if the general structure changes. And so now your documentation is actually responding to what users are doing, and it's asking you and saying, hey, I recognize new behavior. What is this? You know, document this so that I can push this out to the doc site. Uh, not only that, but you can actually sort the examples based off of the popularity, right? So by the, the demographics of the client or just over on the overall popular usage. So <clears throat> this is a uh, open source app that we've built for this called uh, GraphQL Codex. And this will take in any GraphQL schema and generate an SEOable site that's incredibly fast and will allow you to search uh, across the entire thing. So just for reference, uh, OneGraph's schema at this point, I think is probably the largest GraphQL API. It's something like 35 or 40 megabytes of JSON uncompressed. So what I'm going to do here is search for pull request. And you can see it's super fast. And I can come in here, it immediately pops open. And I can see GitHub pull request and all their fields. And I can see, here's an example of it. It shows me in line, but maybe I want to look at it. And as I hover over it, it will give me all these fields, and I can view it in Graphical if I want. And you can see that it has the uh, shortened example there. This was actually submitted from inside of Graphical. And so this is a way of actually taking your API, making it searchable, indexable, um, easily usable for lots of different clients. Uh, and now you have this kind of full cycle where people can submit examples. It'll show up in here. Uh, you always have up-to-date documentation. Anything in here is guaranteed to work um, in terms of the fields being correct and whatnot. Um, so this is yeah, GraphQL Codex, uh, should be open source soon. Um, oh, yes, and it will also produce an automated change log like uh, uh, GitHub's change log. OK, so one other uh, 90 degree turn is persisted queries. Uh, show of hands, who knows about persisted queries? Who's heard of them? OK, uh, for the two people, uh, who has used them in production? OK, so we have two people. All right, so the idea behind persistent queries is a little bit different. Um, the idea is simply that rather than sending over an entire GraphQL query at runtime, this is actually going to become a dev or build time step, where whenever we're running a Webpack uh, build for production, it's going to extract all the GraphQL tags, and it's going to send them to the server. And it's going to say, hey, server, I'm going to need this query in the future. I want you to store it for me. And the server will store it in some fashion, and it will return an ID for that query. And now, inside of your source code, that GraphQL gets replaced with just a call to that, uh, with that doc ID or that uh, query ID. So you're going to be sending over much, much smaller um, queries to the server at runtime. But more importantly, this allows the developer to have that same experience where they're kind of you know, adding whatever fields they want and exploring the graph, and they have full control. But those queries become baked in at build time. So now the end users are not able to add and remove fields uh, willy-nilly. Right? So you have this nice locked down implementation. And so this is really nice for preventing denial of service attacks, for example, where at build time, for example, um, Twitter with TweetDeck, uh, what they do is at build time, they persist all of their queries. None of it is available for the uh, public to hit. <clears throat> and during that persisting phase, it actually costs the query. And it says, how expensive do I expect this query to be? And if it's too expensive, it actually rejects it and tells the developer, you need to break this up into smaller uh, queries. So now the operations people are much happier, right? Because they can bound the amount of pressure that they're going to be under at any given time. The developer is still happy because they can go through and explore all the APIs they want. And then the end user is none the wiser. But in particular, it also allows you, it gives you a wonderful cache key 
right? Cache in GraphQL um, has been a hot topic. Persistent queries give you an amazing cache key. It's just the document ID if it's a public query. And if it's an authenticated query, it's the document ID and the auth token hash. So now you have an exact uh, hash where you can say this should be available for five minutes. And one thing that I'm really excited about that I think is an unexplored area is you're actually able to attach uh, metadata. So in one graph's case, we attach auth to persisted queries. So let me show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna come over here. And this is a mutation that is going to send an email to Jesse, uh, who kindly organized all of this uh, GraphQL track. And this is going to require permission from Gmail. And I consider my Gmail to be a pretty sensitive data source. So what I'm gonna do is create a token that has access to that. So let's call too hot for API days. I'm gonna add access to Gmail. And we'll come in here, we'll authenticate. And Google's like, are you sure? I mean, that's, that's pretty risky. And I'm gonna give it access to all of that stuff. And just for good measure, we'll throw in GitHub here. And so now this one token is gonna have access to Gmail and GitHub. We'll do Spotify. And just for the heck of it, we'll do Twitter. All right, so now we have one token which has access to a tremendous amount of sensitive data for me. So I'm gonna create that token. Now what I'm gonna do is come over to this mutation and I'm gonna persist it. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste it in. And what I'm gonna do is, it's going to persist in such a way that it's parameterized. So I've hard-coded the subject of this and I've hard-coded who it's to. So no one can edit this after I have persisted it. But they can provide a body variable. That's the only thing that they can parameterize. So what I'm gonna do is use, I'm gonna persist it with this auth token. And I'm gonna say the user is allowed to provide body. So go ahead and persist this. And now it gives me a little curl example. So I'm gonna run this in uh, curl. And I'll say, uh, I'm from on stage. And there we go. This is a curl that will actually send an email to Jesse. And it has, it's doing it with a token that is incredibly sensitive. So of course what I'm gonna do is tweet this. Whoops, um, let's do it on uh, a gist because of Twitter's crazy URL shortening. Okay, so we'll create a secret gist. And now on Twitter, anyone is going to be able to run that curl command and send Jesse an email from me, but the subject is going to be locked down and the two is going to be locked down. And I'm not worried about that, uh, the sensitivity of the auth token because the only thing that they have access to is that one mutation and they can only pass in a body variable. So I'm able to lock it down in a really nice way. And in particular, I mean, that's a fun example, but I wanna show you a real world example. So this is a open source um, blogging app that we built that uh, we are basically terrible at blogging. And so we wanted to make it as easy as possible to just push out quick snippets, quick updates. So we call this changelog. As you can see here, there are just some updates on what we're doing as one graph. So you can see lots of different posts and whatnot. This is actually driven from GitHub's API. So if I open up the GitHub API over here, and I go ahead and put them side by side, uh, you can see that if I come in here on this repository, which is one graph changelog, it's open. Anyone can come here and open it. So I'm gonna say hi from on stage. And I'll go ahead and submit that. And if I refresh over here, within a few seconds, it should pop up. What I'm gonna do instead, though, is go ahead and try to react to one of these and say, hey, I like this. What it's doing right now, before I logged in, is it's actually making live queries to GitHub using my co-founder's GitHub auth token. So whenever someone isn't logged in, 
they're still able to access the exact data on GitHub that we need to run this site. So we're able to pull that all in securely and efficiently with GraphQL uh, without worrying about exposing everything. And you'll notice that this is not coming up here because anyone can open an issue on a repository. But only admins for a repository can add a label. So come in there and add that in. And we refresh. We should see it pop up in just a few seconds. And in the meantime, what I'm going to do is come into here, so view from on stage, and I'll add a comment. And we'll add that in. So you can see the comment pops up immediately. And if I like it, and I add some emoticons, works perfectly. And now what I'm going to do is remove the publish tag because my co-founder hates this demo because that actually goes live on our uh, blog update. Uh, yeah, so now it's missing posts, which is great and perfect. There we go. So that's open source. You can use that for anything. Uh, it uses Relay and persistent queries underneath the hood. It's, uh, like a, it's a real world example of building a product that's meaningful um, based off of persistent queries. All right, so that's kind of the end of my demos. And I want to wrap up by talking a little bit about the future, kind of the near future and uh, what I think will happen longer term. So in particular, I think GraphQL lends itself really nicely to this virtuous cycle, where because of the introspectable nature, we can build great tooling. And this enables your developers to actually explore your API really, really easily. They can then experiment and then move from that experiment into a useful context very quickly. But then you as an API provider can run analytics on it, and you can actually analyze how are people using our API. And based off of that, you can create new examples, new documentation. And you can optimize your API. You can say that, oh, it looks like people are trying to do this in a convoluted way. Maybe we could redesign our API a little bit so it would be easier to do that. And that will enable them, our, you know, consumers to be able to explore more easily. And with deep analytics, you can do some pretty crazy things. So in particular, um, I think you can do, like, for new users who have not used your API, you can do something like an auto classification. What we want to do here is make it so that whenever someone comes to our API, even without an account, they can start hitting our API. They won't get real data. We want to give them just dummy data. But the way we're going to do this in a way that is actually meaningful is by watching our production traffic. Every time some data goes over for a field, say first name or email or whatever it might be, we're going to take that value and we're just going to send it to a classifier, some low-level machine learning thing, and we'll just ask it, hey, what does this look like? Uh, because GraphQL will tell you the concrete type of a field, that it's a string, but it won't tell you any semantic information about it, especially not in a way that a computer can help you. But classifiers are very good. And so we just pass it through, and we say, hey, what does this look like? And then we'll say, hey, this looks like a first name, it looks like a full name, a zip code, whatever it might be. And you just store that probabilistic, that statistical information somewhere. And now whenever a user comes to your uh, API page, and they haven't actually signed up yet, you can start generating incredibly realistic data for them to actually build their application. And where this is really useful is for those of you who have a longer sales cycle where the customer wants to actually start building integration today, but they may not actually sign a contract for another six weeks. And so what you can tell them is they can confidently build their UI, build their front end, build their integration on top of you, knowing that once that uh, account is flipped on, everything will work exactly as it did when they were building on your mocked data. And not only that, but you can actually offer them something that no one else can which is you can say, all right, once you've built your UI, we'll break it for you. We will actually fuzz your UI, where you said, all right, I built with a certain expectation of names in mind. But the problem with that is users are unpredictable. It's hard to predict what names are going to look like in production. And so you can say, I built it with you know, my friend's name in mind, but now show me what it looks like with the top 1,000 common English names. Just fuzz my UI. Show me Chinese. Show me right to left. Break my UI. And now just show it, render it 10,000 times over and show me what actually moves in a visual diff as I change these parameters. And now I can design 
with all of these use cases in mind and actually test it out, rather than waiting for it to go to production, a user to uh, hit a bug, and then report it to us if we're lucky. Um, another fun one is because GraphQL has this idea of operations where you can persist more than one operation at a time, and then whenever you're calling it, you actually just specify which of these operations you want, you can kind of build these really powerful endpoints that they can do a lot. And oftentimes what you want to do is say, well, the data from this query is actually used in the data for this mutation. So I just kind of want to run them in this order. So what I've done here is put together a couple of operations. Um, and what this is going to do is whenever I text Twilio, it's going to use that webhook to trigger this process. And it's going to actually see, it's going to take the body of an SMS, and it's going to try to purchase it as a domain. It's then going to create a GitHub repository with that and a Netlify site and deploy something. So, uh, and then most importantly, so let me uh, turn this on and turn on my uh, volume. It's going to get us jammed. So in particular, let's look at this and let's see, what would be a good one? API days on stage.com. Yeah, 2019. So I'm going to send this over. Uh, Twilio is very kindly going to uh, receive that. It's going to send it over to um, OneGraph. It's going to trigger one of those queries to see if a domain is available. If it is, it's then going to go ahead and purchase it. Uh, after it purchases it, it's going to create a GitHub repository. Uh, it's then going to um, create a Netlify site. It's going to start playing my Spotify player. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to repositories. So you can see I got win, win, win playing now. Uh, I'm getting jammed. Uh, and now I'm going to, it created a API days on stage already. And now whenever I come in here, I can go to the API days Netlify. And within a few minutes, uh, it should have deployed a new site. So, you know, if you're ever wanting, if there's a series of things that you want to automate, GraphQL is incredibly amenable to that. Right, because of the way that you can express each of your intents as an operation that's isolated very quickly, and then being able to just thread them together. So you can actually express an entire pipeline of things. So let's see uh, how uh, Netlify is doing for us. And we'll come back to that. So it looks like they're busy building our site. All right, another one is uh, you, know, you can do uh, deep performance monitoring. So I think GraphQL is much more amenable to this than many other systems. In particular, you can get the performance and timing, the error rates, you can get audit logs, the bytes per field. You can prevent breaking schemas very easily. In particular, this one is I'm excited about because you can deprecate old fields that you don't want anymore. And you can identify the specific clients who have ever accessed this field and then reach out to them and say, hey, we want to get you off of this. And we're going to help you. Um, we know exactly you know, who's affected by this. Here's a transformer that's going to change that query that has this old field into the new one automatically. You'll still have to fix your code that reads it, but we'll rewrite all of your deprecated queries automatically. And one thing you can do here, actually, is just never break your clients. So in particular, GraphQL has this idea of no versions. And that means that developers are going to be sad, ultimately, the developers who provide an API. Because you are going to make mistakes as you actually build out your API. And what you want to be able to do is correct those mistakes, but people are already relying on it. So what you can do instead is never break them and never deprecate a field. What you want to do is just create an entirely new schema. What you can do is uh, look at how Stripe does it where Stripe has hundreds and hundreds of versions of their API, uh, which is insane, right? Even as good as they are, that's still insane. But the way they do this is every endpoint has a type for the request and the response. And whenever a request comes in, whenever you add a new endpoint, you write a migration for that request type from the old type to the new one. And what Stripe will do is actually run the migrations for that request until it reaches the most modern version. It will then execute that endpoint and get a result. That result will then run through all the down migrations to get back to what it should have been for that API. So now they maintain one API, but their users are able to hit hundreds of different versions of that API. 
And you can do the same thing with GraphQL. Uh, one I'm really excited about is GDPR, uh, which is not a thing I would have said a while ago. Um, but I think actually there's a lot of really powerful things you can do here. So in particular, just like with authorization and authentication, you can annotate your scheme and say, hey, this is PII, this is HIPAA, this is you know, COPPA, or GDPR. And what you want to do is, now this actually, just like the authorization, GDPR enforcement can be handled orthogonally, just by some middleware. I can say, hey, you don't have access to this, go away. But even if you do have access to this, what I'm going to do is keep a log. I'm going to say that, all right, I see that you're accessing this object, which has GDPR data associated with it, and I'm going to insert the ID field, even if you didn't ask for it. And whenever the server comes back with res its results, I'll go ahead and pluck it out, so you don't want it, but I'll keep it. And what I'm going to do is say that this client ID, which had access, accessed a GraphQL object of this type with this ID and these fields. And now, if you ever get hacked, if there's ever a data breach on your side, I can actually calculate backwards the exact envelope of exposure. I know the exact objects, the exact people, and the exact data that is potentially exposed. Instead of doing that manually and emailing 15 million users, maybe it turns out to be 100. Um, one thing that might be useful, uh, we have a version of this internally, uh, we are looking to open source it at some point, is a way of actually helping people get on board with GraphQL APIs by deriving the ground truth from their existing APIs. And the way this works is as a uh, Rust HTTP client uh, or proxy, or as an Nginx or Sidecar plugin. And what it does is analyze all of the incoming requests, and it looks at the host name, the path, the body, and the output. And it tracks novelty over time. What it wants to know is say, have I seen this host before? Have I seen this endpoint? I've seen this response before, but it always had a name key with a string, and now that name is gone. That must mean that this name key is a knowable string. And it tracks novelty over time and over the uh, number of requests. And eventually, there have been tens of thousands of requests and weeks have gone by, and it's seen everything. Right? It has actually documented the ground truth of your REST API. And then you can use heuristics. Like any field that ends in ID, you set that value aside, and you look at the endpoint, or any endpoint that returns an ID of that value, and it suggests a link between it. If it's a UUID, it very strongly suggests a link. And you can actually derive the graph structure from this automatically, and then generate a GraphQL server that will be about 80% of the way there. It won't be entirely idiomatic, but it will cover the exact ground truth of your API. In fact, we've had partners who come to us and they want us to uh, be the GraphQL front for them. And they say, oh, well, we have open API specs. This will be easy. And we've learned to just say, don't even worry about it. Just install this thing. Because we need to know the ground truth rather than what you think the truth is. So that's a self-contained binary. We want it to be uh, op uh, open source and run on-premise and whatnot. Um, one last one I'll end with is uh, GraphQL Doctor. So this is one that we want to encourage people to basically analyze your queries and teach you best practices. So in this case, you would run it and would say, hey, I noticed that you haven't named your operation and would give you a GUI to do that. It would say that, do you think you might want to parameterize, you might want to change this hard-coded value? If so, what would be the, uh, the name of that? And we'll go ahead and change it for you automatically. So basically something to help new users get over uh, learning all of the best practices. So in summary, I think GraphQL itself offers just huge benefits out of the box, but the tooling that we can build on top of it means that the experience is just night and day difference. Right? We've seen that like, data scientists and managers can get access to it, developers can generate entire applications, et cetera. And I think that this is important because it goes back to time to initial success, frequency, and superpowers. And I think GraphQL gives you all of those tremendously. And you want to basically pick a standard that offers you all of that out of the box rather than you having to reinvent it every single time. So the content of your API is what you should be focusing on, not the tooling. And so I would caution you with, like, I think all these things are really impressive today, but they won't be very soon. They'll just be table stakes. 
right? Our tooling, the, all the stuff that we've shown you, is used in tons and tons of different places now. Uh, GitHub is using it, Gatsby is using it, 8Base is using it, it's everywhere. This will be table stakes. If you don't have this, you'll be seen as laughable, right? If your API requires me to do more work than that Hasura integration I, I showed you, that's insane. So just ask yourself, how is your API going to fit into a world where you're not able to take advantage of all of this tooling? So uh, I'll give away five of the GraphQL books um, to the people who ask the best questions. So if you have any questions about today or you want any demos or anything, happy to give away um, the five uh, best GraphQL books and or grab coffee. So I think that's it. Thank you. I think I feel steam coming out of my ears. There's always <laughs> so much content whenever you speak. Yeah. So we are actually uh, quite over <laughs> on, on time. Uh, would it be okay if we move those questions to the Twitter format? That'd be perfect. Made it be something a little more available. So if you have a question, tweet at him, and then he'll pick what his five favorite and uh, and get you get you a book. Um, so wrapping it up, we're actually over. So I think they're going to be kicking us out of the room here pretty quickly. I do want to have one correction uh, on one of your slides. You had said that I organized oh. the uh, track, and Jonathan actually put together all the speaks, uh, all the, the talks. So a big applause for well, thank Jonathan. You, Jonathan. I just I just gave English uh, where English was <laughs> helpful, and so that was basically the only thing I did. So uh, big thank you to you for getting all the, the speakers. And it was a really uh, great, great day. Uh, GraphQL is still developing, so next year it could be you on stage. So uh, explore something, discover something, learn something that you want to teach uh, to everybody else, and uh, submit the, the call for talks. We have GraphQL talks happening at all the API events uh, this coming year. So there's lots of room. So um, I think that's basically it, actually. One more time, thank you for your talk. Oh, it was amazing. And... We'll see you guys next year. Au revoir.